Girls and boys, I want you to repeat after me. I love a sunburned country, a land of sweeping plains. I love a sunburned country, a land of sweeping plains. Of ragged mountain ranges, of drought and flooding rain. Ragged mountain ranges, of drought and flooding rain. I love her far horizons. I love her dual sea. Her, her beauty and her terror provide ground land for me. Gonna roll up my Matilda and go waltzing back that way. The year was 1949. One of the greatest Australian adventures was about to begin. But we didn't know it yet. I've just about lost everything I've got, but I guess there's plenty of people worse off than I am. I'll be happy in my dear old Aussie home. Floods and rabbit plague were giving us trouble, but post-war Australia was going strong. The price of wool was high, Australian women were back in their traditional place. The US troops and their coloured servicemen had gone back home. I've had a marvellous time. It's a bit of all right. And Brave New World was on the banned book list. Mr McKell opens the bus project with a bang. But on October the 17th, 1949, the unthinkable began when the first blast of the Snowy Mountain scheme shook the town of Adaminibi, population 200. That's the start of a project to give New South Wales and Victoria vast supplies of power and water. The scheme was described by Prime Minister Ben Chifley as the greatest single project in our history. The 200 million pound Snowy River hydroelectric scheme will mean 20 million pounds in production to Australia each year. The giant network of dams, tunnels, aqueducts and power stations would take 25 years, 100,000 people and $1 billion to build. It would straddle an area roughly the size of Switzerland. And along with the Eiffel Tower and the Panama Canal, it would become one of the engineering wonders of the world. And in the process, it would transform a British backwater into a vibrant nation with a unique sense of identity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing before you as a country party candidate. I wish to introduce my family. My wife, who is the mother of five Australians, the grandmother of three, my daughter and son-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Fred Moore, with their two children, the sixth generation of Australian-born. My son here... In the insular the climate of the time, and with the opposition leader Robert Menzies boycotting the opening, the go-ahead for the scheme was a major victory for the Labor government. Here in this thirsty wilderness, they tried and failed a man. Meanwhile, Australia needed water more than ever before. Agriculture in the vast inland areas was just waiting for a kick start. The land was fertile but dry, ready to come to life with irrigation. And in the cities, coal strikes were disrupting power supply for fledgling industries. Ben Chifley's dream of Australia's reconstruction was under threat. I ask the help of the people of Australia in the great tasks that confront us. The achieving of victory and the rebuilding of the nation. In that task, I shall carry out my work to the best of my ability. Today, five-sixths of Europe and Asia are under the iron heel of communism. Does that disturb you? It should. 
the old catch cry, populate or perish, took on a new meaning in the late 40s. It was the onslaught of the Red Star in Europe and the Yellow Peril right there on Australia's doorstep. Seeming millions are on our doorstep, while we Australians are so few. There were now just 8 million Australians on a landmass the size of the United States. And with a great deal of reconstruction to be done, even the post-war baby boom was not producing a big enough population. The mission is vital to the nation. I am going abroad to seek ships or immigrants. If we have no ships, we shall get no immigrants. And without immigration, the future of the Australia we know will be both uneasy and brief. As a nation, we shall not survive. The newborn Snowy Mountains Authority swung into action. But the locals were hardly impressed. The animosity, I think, was aimed more at the establishment. And I can recall this fellow telling me that they didn't need no smart-ass engineers coming down here telling us how to run our bloody town. We've been doing all right for the last hundred years and we don't need them. With its freezing winters and scorching summers, the wild mountains country was rough territory. Snowy mountains had never been surveyed in depth. There were no reliable maps and no real idea of where the snowmelt water came from. Every rock formation and every river's bend had to be put on the map. And for a few years, small teams of surveyors lived in isolation, almost buried in snow, laying the foundations of the vast construction work to follow. There were surveyors and geologists. There were others with diamond drills plumbed the very heart of the mountains until these great hills had no more secrets to yield. The official films appealed to the man from Snowy River in the Aussie spirit. And the workers on the Snowy scheme certainly lived up to it. Access roads were built from scratch, land and air transport were brought in, and working camps were set up in record time, along with power and communications. In charge of this gigantic project is Commissioner Hudson, a man with a mighty big job. A 200 million pound project for a richer, more productive Australia. The new Commissioner's salary was higher than the Prime Minister's but Bill Hudson clearly preferred engineering to politics. So much so that Robert Menzies nicknamed him the Lion of Cooma, the Lamb of Canberra. His first challenge was to sell the scheme to all Australians. And long before customer focus became a buzzword, a major public relations campaign was in full swing. Water.